Welcome in everybody to Dodger Heads presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Scott Gearman. We've got a bunch of fresh topics to talk about today. We're lucky enough to be joined by one of the absolute best in the business, a man I always appreciate running into, Juan Toribio, covers the Dodgers for MLB.com. Also joining us is our managing editor at Dodger Blue, Blake Williams. It's good to have you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, yeah, man, for-, come on. Yeah, thanks for, I think it's my first time on here. So thank you guys for having me. Absolutely. I think we spoke to you. I think Jeff might have had you at spring training maybe last year just to cover some quick immediate news, but Mm -hmm. nothing for a real sit down. So, man, I mean, I always you're one of my favorite people in the business. It's good to have you, fellow short king. Uh, So let's you know, we've got a lot. There's a lot. Dodgers are an exciting team right now. Five and two just took three or four against the Cardinals. Big win over the Giants last night. Um, Overall, Juan, what are some of the kind of things you've seen from the team so far? Yeah, I mean, I think the the one that stands out is like it's gonna be impossible to get twenty seven outs against them. Like, I mean, you saw it on Saturday; they kind of come back from from a couple run deficit, uh, down down to their last out, then single, 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 t- bang, tie game, uh, and then you saw it again on Sunday. You know, they're down four runs; they get two back immediately, then they get two. In, what was it? Two in the. I don't even remember anymore. Matt Muncy hits it over three in the eighth. Um, and then, you know, it's, it seems like it's impossible for them to get through a mm-hmm. game without having one of those those rallies where they put up a crooked number. So I think that's the one thing that stands out. You know, we we heard so much about this offense. We, you know, we wrote about it so much. We talked about it so much. Um, and now we're kind of seeing it, like, just kind of play out and how tough it is for, for an opposing team to go through it three, four times. Um, in the game, because now it's like it's, it's you know Mookie's kind of leading the way. And then you have Shohei, who's not really getting going yet, and then Freddie's kind of on, in that same in that same way, you know, getting a bunch of hits, but not necessarily you know destroying the ball like we're, we're used to seeing him. But then you have Teoscar and Muncie and Altman and I mean Lux. It, I mean it's 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 pretty remarkable. It's Will Smith, right? Like but the best hitting catcher in baseball is just like casually just there hitting fours. So I think that, it, you know, we're starting to see just how difficult it is going to be for, for anyone to get 27 outs. Yeah. And it kind of feels like it's not that they've underwhelmed it. It just feels that there's been some conversations aside from who, what the Dodgers have really put together here or the, the you know, the collection of star talent they've put together. And I don't know if it's just myself feeling that, but it kind of feels that, you know, you know, the Otani news and, you know, soul and how everything kind of just gelled together. It just, it, it doesn't feel like we're actually understanding the gravity of what they've really got going on. Uh, I hope it's not just because it's so ho hum of the Dodgers to put this stuff together, but seeing Shohei Otani on the Dodgers is just, uh, it, it, it just kind of happened. We we're just, we had so much news about it that it's here and it's, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's just for me how it feels. I, I know Blake, we've kind of talked about that a bit. About how it's just we I don't know if we we understand that Shohei Otani's with the Dodgers now, but it's just it's just an important thing for me to really bring up. Like, is there anything else you've seen too? Like that just to echo on that? Yeah, I think it's pretty incredible how they're averaging close to seven runs a game, and we haven't seen Otani get going. We haven't seen the bottom of their lineup really get going. It's really just been Mookie, Teoscar, Freeman, and a bit of Will Smith kind of driving the offense so far. So when you see everyone starting to click. I think it's going to be really impressive. And then like, we haven't really discussed the starting pitchers that have been phenomenal. Yeah. They've been striking people out. They've been getting innings for the Dodgers, throwing scoreless innings pretty consistently. Like they've been clicking, but they also haven't been fully clicking and they're winning. And it's pretty impressive to see. Yeah. Juan, I kind of want to just come right to you on this, that you, you noted that, you know, Tani hasn't really gotten going. Uh, we are going to talk about this later on in the show, but we'll, we'll what do you think Otani really needs to do? For you know, a lot we keep hearing a ton that, like in my own camps, that Otani just needs to get his first big swing, his first one home run. Maybe he'll take be able to take a breath of fresh air. But we've seen him have good swings. It just feels like there's one we just kind of have to get going. He needs to put like a you know uh, maybe a rocket. He needs to get a nuke, something just to really kind of get that monkey off his back. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely something to that. I mean, I, we've seen him just swing trying to hit it to to the moon, right? I mean, basically every game he has one or two of those swings. Um, you know, and I, I'm still kind of getting to know him. Obviously, I mean, you you watch him, you know, when you watch highlights, or you watch like a, a random Angels game uh, mm-hmm. when they were down 10, 10 or three. <laughs> like, um, but you know, you watch some other games, and, and you know, but now I'm starting to kind of get a, a better understanding of of who he is in the box. And he is a free swinger. I mean, I, I don't I don't think we're going to see like a Juan Soto type guy, right? Like who's just 
trying to draw a walk. Like he is, he's he's not going up there trying to draw a walk. Like he's trying, he's going up there trying to do some damage. Um, and I think there might be some pressing. I mean, it, it looks like he's a little bit jumpy um, at times. Uh, and like you said, I think some of that comes with dude. I just got seven hundred million dollars. I'm playing for a new team. My, you know, my teammates have heard about how great I am. Now I want to hit one four hundred and fifty. You know, four hundred and fifty feet. Um, and I think he just kind of needs to see one go over the fence. Um, you know, it's kind of like me playing basketball, right? Like he's got to see one go in. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, like me. Yes. Right, exactly. You know, that's what that's what that's how hoopers are. You know. Uh, so I think he's, I think, like you said, I think one big swing, one home run, one, you know, one off the top of the wall, like anything, I think just to get the crowd going. I don't think the crowd has really gotten going. Kind of to your point, like it hasn't hit that Shohei Otani's a Dodger because he hasn't really had a moment yet. You know, you mm-hmm. kind of had it coming a couple nights ago when he had the bases loaded, two outs. You know, it just felt like the, it was a perfect spot for him to just hit a grand slam and like the whole, the whole world was just going to like lit up on fire, right? Um, he popped up. And, it's, and that, even that one was kind of like a, a, a progress of maybe he was a little bit too jumpy, you know, kind of got ahead of it on, on a pitch that we've seen him hammer a million times in his career. So I think going back to your point, I think once he gets one of those, I think it will snowball. And from everything I, I've, I've heard and I've talked to people about, he is pretty streaky. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he is one of those streaky hitters, kind of like Mookie, right? Like Mookie's pretty consistent, but then he has – this stretch out of nowhere where it's just like, oh, my God, this guy's never going to go out, uh, which is kind of what, what's happening right now. Uh, so I think once he gets going, people are going to start taking notice of like, oh, yeah, th- they're going to have to deal with this dude for the next 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. Why? I remember I saw you tweet the other night about how uh, Max Muncy kind of had that first big exclamation point at Dodger Stadium. So I think, yeah, Otani gets him, gets one uh, and then he you know get rolling because I remember, I mean, I would flip on angel games just for the sake of doing it. And and if you actually looked at what Otani, that's how he is, you know, he'll get in a groove where it's like, he's seeing a bowling ball, a beach ball. So it's, uh, I think there's a lot to that, that he's, he's definitely a streaky guy, but I think he's in a good spot in the lineup. He's got finally has protection. Uh, and it's like a few guys. And I Blake, do you think that, you know, we'll just bounce off a couple uh, Shohei Otani, Teoscar Hernandez, are these two guys that are benefiting just immensely from having protection both front and behind them in the lineup. With Teoscar, I think it's more of a case of he's seeing the ball better at Dodger Stadium than he was Mm -hmm. in Seattle. He seems to be more comfortable in the box and actually picking up the ball. He hit that home run yesterday off the Giants righty specialist there. And I think that kind of shocked a lot of people And the swing. Like it didn't look like a great swing and he still just had the strength and power to hit it out of the ballpark there. So I think it's for him, it's just about feeling more comfortable than not having or having the protection in the lineup now with Otani, like, I think we're going to see it and it's going to benefit him. I, I think I've made my case known about lineup protection, like not doing a whole lot for statistic performances, but yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't hurt to have Freddie Freeman hitting behind you and Mookie Betts hitting in front of you. That's for sure. Absolutely. Okay. So we'll want to talk about it. Two guys that were lucky enough to make the trip sold to Seoul, South Korea, uh, I know one of you enjoyed, you know, the cuisine out there. One of you actually took part in that aside from, you know, just what was around the hotel. Juan, I, I, I hope that was you. And I hope I'm not, you know, going out on a limb here. Uh, from a personal sp- perspective, what was kind of the opportunity, like the experience, uh, Juan, about watching the Dodgers play in South Korea, playing the exhibition games, going through the motions there? What was kind of a unique view from what you what you actually, you know, got to experience there? Yeah, no, I think it was pretty incredible, honestly. I mean, I, I don't think I've told a lot of people this. It's like I don't think I ever would have thought I would I was going to ever go to Seoul, South Korea, like in my mm-hmm. life. Right. You know, growing up, you know, my family is a Hispanic family, like Dominican family. And you never even talk about going to Asia. Uh, so being able to do that it, just off rip. I mean, that that alone was was pretty incredible. And then being being able to go to a baseball game. Um, kind of see that culture a little bit, how how they kind of uh, it kind of reminded me of of like Dominican Republic a little bit, right? Like you have all this entertainment and the dancers, and it's more than just a, a game. Uh, which here in the United States, uh, you know, it's obviously the best baseball in the world, uh, but it, it could get a little bit boring, right? Like it's just you, people just kind of sit there, and it's just kind of all part of it. Like the the people, the players on the field is what makes it fun. Uh, in other countries, since the level of baseball isn't quite where it is here, 
you need kind of some of this other stuff to kind of keep you engaged. So I think seeing some of that, seeing the, the cheerleaders, seeing the drums, uh, it was actually really cool to see that. Uh, and yeah, watching a baseball game on the other side of the world, like I said, it's definitely not something I ever thought I was going to do in my life. Uh, so being able to say I, I went to Seoul, South Korea to, to watch the first uh, MLB game ever played over there. Like, that, I mean, that's something that like, when once you kind of do it, you take, take a step back. Uh, it is pretty incredible to even think about. Uh, the food was awesome. I mean, the, that was the first time knowing my life. I will say this: like, I went to Europe this this winter, and, went, and it didn't feel like I was in Europe. Like, it felt it kind of felt like I was like in New York. Like, everyone speaks English, and it's kind of like I don't know, it's pretty. I don't want to say Americanized, but English is a pretty dominant language there. Yeah. In Seoul, that's not the case. <laughs> like, that was the first time <laughs> in my life where I was like. Oh, oh damn! I really, don't, I really can't communicate with people. Yeah, uh, like I'm just on Google Translate, like constantly. I'm at a restaurant; it takes me 25 minutes to order. Uh, but I, even all that was kind of cool, right? You know, I, you know, I'm lucky enough to speak Spanish, so when I go to like a you know a, a Latin American country, like I can still communicate. So that was really mm -hmm. the first time in my life where I was like, "Dude, this is this is insane!" Like I'm like in the nitty gritty here, of my Korea. Okay, good. Trying to order yeah, some Korean yeah. barbecue. Yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw. So you saw you post the pictures. I was like, man, damn. I know. I was jealous. I'm sitting sitting at home eating my, you know, boring food, and I was like, shit, man. This is this and is the, the food best was stuff. great too, Blake. I, you I, know, I don't know what you got to eat over there, but like the food was awesome. It was really cheap too. Like, uh, the meat was unbelievable. Like the Korean barbecue mm. was next level. Uh, you know, you get some pretty good Korean barbecue here in LA, but like that was like next level. Might have been heightened a little bit just for being there. Then it just enhances the whole entire experience. Blake, I know, you know, what about you, man? Like we haven't, we've had, we've talked just a tiny bit and just, I know how the time change has kind of been affecting you and getting your sleep schedule back. And I know that for both of you, that's probably been a thing just looking at the clock and you're like, oh, but you know, what about you, Blake? Like what's been, what was the best part? What was the worst part? And cause like, I know you, man, you'll tell me the first thing you'll be like, everything will be great. And then you'll immediately, you'll be like, yeah, but this sucked. And you know, what do you got? <laughs> Um, so I still think the best part was going to the DMZ and a bit disappointed one who didn't get to go out there because pretty sure it was your idea to go there, right? Was, I just found yeah. out you didn't go. Dude, the tour was like eight hours long. We were like, we, we don't have time for this. And there was oh. like freezing out too. I mean, it was okay. going to be, I was going to be complaining the whole time. Yeah, it took me like nine hours and it was pretty cold there. And I'm not someone who complains about the cold. So, but it was a really cool experience. Like. It's something I probably never get to do again. So like I had to go out there and do it. I don't regret it or anything. It was definitely a cool experience. And that was probably my favorite part. But I think like what Juan was talking about, the language barrier, like dealing with that, it was a challenge. I had someone on the street trying to talk to me and like I didn't understand it all. And I put up the translator to him and like I only got a sliver of what he was saying. So like I still don't know what he said, but it was just <laughs> a cool experience there. Like it definitely took me out of my comfort zone because I've never dealt with something like that. Like that was my first time going out of the country at all. So getting to experience that was really cool. And then of course, seeing the Dodgers play out there, like it was just a really neat experience. Absolutely. So man. And, and Big Google thing. Maps doesn't don't work there. That was, no. that was crazy. What? No. So out of an, out of an, you can't out, out of an, out of it. Yeah. So you have to like download like another like navigation thing that they have, but it's also like in Korean. Oh, you're I, had, I had Apple Maps working. Oh, did it? See, people told me don't use Google Maps, and I was like, all right, I won't. Oh, did it. That that was tough. Like I just stayed in my hotel room, and like I was just like, eh, this is just where I'm gonna be. <laughs> he said, eh. <laughs> yeah, I got, I get it. It's out of just out of your comfort zone. So I was jealous. Hopefully next year. I mean, next year we might. I mean, there's some rum. There's some rumbling. Sources are saying that there were you know Dodger Blues considering. So we'll we'll see if we'll see you there, man. That's something I'm I'm looking forward to if it happens. Blake and Scott possibly taking over. It's Japan, right? A plan. Yeah. Yeah. That's we'll see if MLB confirms it. That's what yeah, they we'll say. see. So, I'm trying to find uh, another border that we can that we can try and go and invade like the DMZ. You know? What's oh man. Uh so Will Smith signing. Congratulations, man. You know, I know you're the first kind of report. Uh Dodgers and Will Smith were close on a deal. Ten years, hundred forty million dollars, uh deferred money in there, a thirty million dollar signing bonus, I believe. Um, we know his value to the Dodgers, all-star catcher, top five in the game, you know, arguably the best offensive catcher, you know, past several years. Um, you know, Juan, what does this, like, what, 
aside from the obvious, unless you're just going to tell me the obvious, which is fine. What does Will Smith bring to the Dodgers? He's really good. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, I think this is something that they've wanted to do for a couple of years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I will say this, like when I first got here in 2021, like that was my first year covering the Dodgers. Like you kind of knew, you know, Mookie and Seager and obviously Kershaw. Like you knew those guys were the best of the best. Right. But when you kind of started, when I started digging into some of the, obviously 2020 was a shortened year. Um, so some of those things are kind of skewed, but I, I was starting to look at some of Will Smith's numbers and I was like, dude, this guy's like incredible. Uh, you know, you don't see catchers really like that, like just hit the ball so hard. Uh, and now he's becoming an, an, like a, a pretty good de- defensive catcher as well. Um, but just the way he hits the ball, the way he doesn't strike out a lot. Um, I mean, it, it is pretty a remarkable combination of the power. Uh, he's actually kind of fast too, right? Like for a catcher, like he can run. Uh, so I think the, the combination of all that stuff, I was like, this guy's like a, a star. Uh, and then getting to getting to watch him a couple of, you know, for the last couple of years, uh, it all translates onto the field, right? Like he's not just like a stat cast, you know, creation. Like he's actually like really good on the field as well. Uh, so I think this is something that the Dodgers have wanted to do for a couple of years. Uh, they've tried in the past. You know, it's it's obviously hard to kind of come to an agreement on one of these extensions. Uh, but once they once they identified, you know, we have this core group for the next at least five years until Freddie. Uh, you know, until Freddie's contract is up, and it's like we need to we need to build this core, and we just need to make sure this this stays together. And I think Will Smith was right at the top of that list. Like they were like, this is the guy who we want to just lock up catcher for. You know, he. he let, I mean, let's face it, he's probably not going to be the catcher for the next ten years. Uh, if he's catching at thirty nine or whatever it is, like I'll be impressed. <laughs> backup, yeah. Well, then their backup plan. Then what was it? You know what I mean? Like if they're right. forcing him to do that, neck, it's it's obviously a situation where they don't have a next step. But I just like you said, I've been I've been hearing or I've been talking a bunch about how he'll slot into a corner infield position and he'll still be in. That's a incredibly like a productive offensive bat. Like right. there's a reason why no catcher has received a ten year deal. Like he's the first. So like, yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and he, you know, he's a little bit old, like not old, but he's a little bit older. It's not like he's signing at 21 years old, right? Uh, so eventually, he is going to move out catcher, but for the next five, six years, like he's going to catch and he's going to be really good at it. Um, and just having that top four locked up for at least the next four seasons, uh, I think that's, a, I mean, that's pretty scary because he's going to keep getting better. Uh, I mean, Mookie's just unbelievable. Freddie, it's just going to, he's going to get three dozen hits in his sleep. Uh, and then, oh yeah, there's Shohei Otani, who's the, the best player in the world, just yeah. sitting there in the two hole. So I think getting those four guys locked in was really important to them. Uh, and for Will, it was also important that he—I mean, he wanted to be here, right? Everyone's going to talk about he could have gotten more money in free agency, and like, yeah, I'm for sure he could have gotten more money in free agency. Uh, but we've seen free agency kind of work out in the past, right? Like, you might get more money, you might get well in this case, you probably won't get more years, but you, you might get more money. But it might be somewhere that you don't want to play in. And at the end of the day, it is your career. You're the one that has to live in that city. It's not your agent. It's not the GM. It's it's you. And I think he's just decided, you know, leaving money on the table, even though I'm getting $140 million, uh, that's something that's, that, that was worth for him. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's just it was not shocking, but because I know Blake and I, we talked about how what's the next step for what would the Dodgers do without Will Smith? You know, obviously they – they're heralded because they always have some like a considerable amount of catching depth seems every year. Uh, and it was just, if this didn't get done, you, you have to keep looking towards like who will be ready, who will be available. When will they make that jump? Because it's not just a, a infield. It's not like a second baseman. You're going to call up and try them out or what the Rangers are doing can just funnel in prospects all the time. It's like, it's a catcher position. It's a big thing. So, you know, kind of uh, Blake, I want to ask you this. And then Juan, I know you have a ton to probably to add is that, you know, what does this deal do for a Dalton rushing a Diego Cartaya uh, midseason trade scenario? Who do who is held on to? What do they kind of do there? Do they just kind of, you know, keep the vault full there and or, and just keep looking toward what they project and what they can kind of do later on? Or this is this becomes their, their, their trade scenarios kind of bump up now that they've kind of locked in Will Smith forever. Yeah, so I still think Dalton Rushing is kind of their catcher of the future at some point, whenever that may be. He'll take over for Will Smith, and they'll put Will Smith at third or first, like you kind of mentioned. But it kind of gives them some time to not rush Rushing. 
which I didn't really plan on that one coming uh -huh. out like that, but it did. Um, <laughs> so like he can right. come in and be the backup catcher and kind of maybe platoon a bit with Will Smith as the lefty compliment there with Diego Cartaya. I still think there's some upside there, but he's obviously coming off a pretty bad year and he's dealt with some back injuries throughout his career. So that's concerning. But with the catcher position, it's one of those things where their development is kind of tougher than most other positions because aside from the offense, there's also the defense and game planning portions of it. So catchers usually debut a little later than most other positions. I think Will Smith was like 25 or 24 or something when he came up. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like what the trend's going to be there. I, I think they're going to give rushing some time and not have to bring him up so quickly as opposed to a, if Will Smith became a free agent and they lost him, then they'd kind of be forcing him into that starting spot. And then it's always good to have that depth and trade pieces. And these things tend to work themselves out. I'm sure the Dodgers aren't like focused on, oh, we have to move Cartaya now because we gave Will Smith a contract extension. Like it's going to work itself out. There's going to be a team that's going to need a catcher and they're going to line up on a trade with someone at some point. And a lot of times catcher prospects fail. That's kind of the position of all prospects that they're in, but catcher specifically, it's just a tougher road for them. So I think they're in a good spot with their catching and it's not something where they need to like figure out their long-term plans right now or panic about having to move guys at any point. Yeah. I mean, and while we can stay on the prospect train, we can stay on the, the, the speculation of looking towards position. I'm all my, my pre show board is blown up because we're just, this is, we're going in a couple different spots here, but uh, the, so stand on the, on the plane that uh, having prospects available to move or speculation on what the Dodgers have to lock in. Because for me, I, I've spoke on a couple different shows about, how the Dodgers tend to look towards positions to lock up. Like the opportunity to lock up the shortstop position is something that they just haven't really done since Trey Turner left. Lux, uh, that's that's something that's been the Gavin Lux, you know, experience so far has put Mookie Betts in a position where he's in his 30s. He's a superstar player who they projected him being the starting second baseman to start the year, gets moved to shortstop. And now he's kind of made its own personal goal to really be the like be one of the best at that position and he's already doing a fantastic job and on that front he's he's in, he's more engaged than he otherwise would be because he's trying to get better at his defense you know Juan what have you seen from Mookie what is he doing differently uh and is this kind of something that's sustainable like him playing the shortstop position something the Dodgers want to do or is this something just for the time being yeah and I think I mean, obviously Blake sees this as well at Dodger Stadium like we get there at say two o'clock for a seven o'clock game um by 2 30 mookie's out there just mm -hmm. grinding you know taking fungos taking you know working on his on his uh routine with clayton mcculloch like this is at 2 30 there's nobody else out there like you just see guys like doing the grounding out on the outfield or whatever like man pretty chill stuff you may you, you might see some pitchers you know playing catch uh, you mostly just see little kids, right? Like all, all the kids of like the coaches and the players running around and you, like other players are really not in it's, and it's not their fault. It's two 30, right? Like, it's five hours before this game. Um, and you see him out there and he's just getting ready. And then, you know, we go back into the clubhouse at three o'clock. We come right back out. It's three 30. There's Mookie still taking ground balls, still, still doing all these things. Um, you know, I think the, the work that he's really put, and you know, we always talk about people that work hard and you know all this stuff, and they all work hard, right? They, they're professional athletes; they're like the best at what they do in the world. But I think seeing this, uh, I think for everybody has been kind of remarkable. Just see, it's like an hour and a half every single day uh, before he even has to be out there, and that's not even including the hitting side of things. And, you know, we've we've kind of seen the start that he's off to offensively. Um, you know, he gets there. He, I actually have a story out on this today. Like he told me he gets there an, an hour earlier than he did in previous years, just because like he needs to get an early work in. Um, and I think he said something really fascinating. It was like, dude, I was, I was terrible on right field. And he was like, when they moved me to the outfield, I was terrible. Uh, like I remember dropping pop flies. I remember getting sun balls. I remember getting all these things. And he goes, nobody remembers that because when they saw me in the, in the big leagues, like I was Mookie. Uh, and he was like, and I, it was the same exact process that I'm going through now. So I think at first I was probably among the people that was like, wait, so you're moving your best right fielder to shortstop who he's never played in his life. Well, not in his life, but in, in, as a pro. And like, this is like your best chance to win. Like at that point, I was like, 
I don't know how how this super team works, right? Like you don't have a shortstop. Now I'm like, he might he might just become a really good, you know, starting shortstop in the big leagues. Um, and yeah. and he really is engaged. Like he loves the. I mean, I think he was pretty tired of playing right field, honestly. You know, even before they moved him to the infield, he was just kind of like, yeah, it, it, you know, I just go out there because that's what they pay me to do. Like, right. It wasn't it wasn't a passion of his at that point in time. It was just kind of like what he was really good at. And everyone likes to do things that they're really good at. But I think now it's just kind of a, a challenge for him. And it does free him up offensively of just like, oh, let me just go hit. As opposed to, you know, I got to work on my mechanics. I got to watch video. I got to do all these things. Yeah. Now he's just like, I just got to make sure I'm a good shortstop. Uh, so I do think this is something that can carry on for a little bit longer than even all of us anticipated. You know, I think everyone was just kind of like, oh, we'll just wait to the deadline. And we'll get Willie Adamas. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's just kind of like the, like, poof, let's just do a this. Hot topic. It, no, it is. It, 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 it's 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 it, it, the low-hanging fruit, but it seems like the most, like, uh, not the most logical, but something that the Dodgers could pull off. And and it's a scenario that we've seen before. There's Seager, Corey Seager went down and they, they trade for Manny Machado. Like it was, it felt right. like a foregone conclusion that this is stuff that they the, like the, the logical thing that they could do. But with Mookie's already at three defensive runs saved, just like you said, he's put in the extra work. And I was not, you know, Blake, see what he had, you have to say on this. But it's like it almost feels that they've Mookie bets work like putting in this extra work has kind of put the Dodgers in a spot where they're like, ah, maybe we don't need this isn't such a pressing thing. They can kind of, you know, pause that panic meter on do we have to move off of Gavin Lux? You know, we have Miguel Rojas there. Like, they have an enough offensively around it because I've spoken before about how you don't need to have a superstar at every position. Like, you can make stuff work. And Mookie Betts, being already what he is and six-time Gold Glover in right field, says we're going to go play on the dirt, and he's excelling there. Blake, do you think Mookie Betts has kind of put the Dodgers in a position where he's playing well enough that – their plan of perhaps taking a load off of his body has kind of put him in a spot where they might have worked themselves into an everyday shortstop. I mean, at least for this season. Yeah, I think for at least for the season's kind of the carrying card there. I don't think they're going to want to keep him at shortstop long term just because the impact it's going to make on his body. And I think Willie Adamas probably is going to be the last chance to go get a really talented shortstop in the free agency market this offseason because a lot of guys are locked up long term. And I'm not necessarily sure Bo Bichette's going to be a free agent. I think the Blue Jays are going to want to get him locked up. And if he does, that's going to be a bidding war. That's probably going to go above what the Dodgers are willing to pay with the contracts they already have. So I think Adamus might still be in their plans potentially next year or at some point. I just don't think they need to go make that pressing trade at the trade deadline and potentially overpay. It seems like Mookie's kind of locked up that spot for this year, and they can kind of wait, see what Gavin Lux does. Maybe he becomes a trade piece. Maybe they move him to left field and give him a full offseason to work in the outfield. So I think they have some options now. That's good for them. But, of course, if they want to add a bat, Adamus would still be a great piece at the deadline. And I think they might need a right-handed bat to help with their lineup against left-handed pitching. I still think it's a little weaker there, especially with the guys in the NL West that are there now. So, But it's just really encouraging what Mookie's been able to do and all the credit to him. Yeah, I, I just – I. I'm a known, like I'm a known Mookie Stan. Like it, it's obvious, but it, we all should really understand what a superstar player was willing to do at this stage of his career. Like six gold gloves, like Wilson player, defensive player of the year. Like you don't see this stuff. You, you just truly don't. And it's just something that Mookie Betts is so talented. He plays other sports. People harp that he bowls so much. It's like he does other things, but now he's taking on a premium position and, and he wants to be one of the best. So uh, it shouldn't be understated. It should be talked about more, and it's just lost on a team with so much chatter and so many other things. But I, I just, I have a hard time not bringing up Teoscar Hernandez, Juan, and it's somebody that has been kind of my X factor. I, 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 I know you like him too. Like we, we've got to give him his credit. Like for you, is he one of, around Major League Baseball? Is he one of the a front runner for possibly one year deal of the year? Yeah, I, I mean, for sure. I think the way the market worked this off season, like there was probably no reason why he only got a one-year deal. Like he, there should have been teams giving him three, four years. Granted he had a bad ish season in Seattle, but a bad ish season in Seattle was still a pretty good freaking year. Um, and it, it was in Seattle. I think all of us kind of forget how difficult it is to hit over there, especially for, for a right-handed uh, hitter. So I think the way it, worked, it all worked, that was a per was kind of the perfect storm for the Dodgers of like, you know, teams aren't offering him the four year deal that he wants. Let's just give him one year and let's just throw a bunch of money at him. You know, albeit some of it deferred, but 
let's let's see if he bites. You know, it can kind of be one of those platform years for him. Um, and it's turning out to be a pretty good, pretty good platform year. Obviously, we're only seven games in, but I think you kind of see everything that he had when he was in Toronto, right? Like he is, is he going to strike out a ton? Yes. But he's also going to hit a lot of home runs. Uh, he's going to, you know, he has that knack to, you know, provide that big hit when, when it's needed. So I think when it comes to one year deals, like I said, there was probably no reason why he only got one year from, from other teams in the league. Uh, but the Dodgers were like, all right, yeah, we'll do it. Why not? Let's just get a guy who was a former, you know, this guy was really good in Toronto, like really, yeah. really good in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, it's just because he, he had a, a, a baddish year in Seattle doesn't mean that he just stopped learning how to hit. Um, like he's going to hit and he's hitting six on this team. By the time team, by the time pitchers get through Max Muncy, they're, they're like two, no more. And then you just get this guy who's yep. just going to hit 40 home runs this year. Right. It's just kind of like, yeah, let's, let, let's, let's just do it. Wow. Um, I think it's pretty yeah. remarkable to see. Yeah, I mean, his swing and miss is going to be there, but just like you saw last night, he's going to see the first pitch of a you know a funky delivery, spin on it, and then come back hit a bomb. Like it, it, the Dodgers needed that. They need you need these guys. Like at least, I mean, they've had it in the past, but where you're going to see a hanger and he's might not be looking for that pitch, but it's just there and he's going to bang it. So it, Blake's talked to me about it before that this is a bat that it, it's he's a he's an he's an important piece. He slots right in there. And with how, you know, Jason Hayward, James Altman, Gavin Lux kind of trying finding their own at the moment, uh, he, he's a consistent bat that was necessary. Uh, the last thing we have to get into is kind of we'll, we'll run through this pretty quick. You know, from the starting pitching group, we've seen them through the first turn, through the rotation. They've been solid. Three ERA, right around a one whip, surrendering like a two less than a 200 batting average. Uh, Yamamoto bounced back at his second start, which is terrific to see. Um what have you kind of seen from Bobby Miller, Gavin Stone? Because those are the guys that second year dudes that we need to hear from more. Uh, and I know you love Tyler Glass now. And we all know what he's done and we expected him to do this. Uh, at least ones who paid attention to Tyler Glass now. What have you really seen from Bobby Miller, Gavin Stone in their second year? Yeah, I think the first Bobby Miller start was unbelievable. I think yeah. that was kind of the Bobby Miller that you read about, right? It's like, Oh yeah, he throws hard, but he doesn't necessarily miss a lot of bats. At least for the for the type of of velocity that he has and the arsenal that he has, and he missed a lot of bats on on Saturday. Uh, mm -hmm. it was a Friday? So other days blend in. Uh, he missed a lot of bats, and I think if he can get to that point, like the changeup was unbelievable. I think if he can get that pitch working consistently, uh, I think he's gonna be in that conversation at, at the end of the year for like. I, I don't know. I don't want to say Cy Young, but that's hey, who knows. Why not? Like, yeah. He has the stuff. I mean, he throws a hundred. He has four pitches. Um, you know, I, I've, I got to cover you know Blake Snell in the past when I was in Tampa Bay. He, he's a four pitch guy, right? It's like, and that was what made him so dominant. And once he got the changeup working, that's when he became a Cy Young guy. Um, and I think for Bobby Miller, he's starting to understand like the changeup is like a huge weapon. Like everyone loves the curveball. Everyone loves the slider for some punchies. But if you get the changeup in there and, and you're pumping in a hundred uh yeah. you're almost impossible to hit you have all four quadrants like i don't know it's just it seems it seems like he has it all kind of working right now which is pretty scary to think and you have gavin stone who also has a pretty good changeup of his own uh and i think he now he has a little slider thing working uh yeah. that he can play off against right-handed hitters so i think he start, he's still tr trying to figure out who he is as a major league pitcher um he, he has nothing else to prove in the minor leagues like i think we've all seen that uh, yes. Now I'm just trying to figure out how can I be successful here. And he had an unbelievable spring. He kind of earned that that fifth starter job. Like I think even if Emma Sheehan would have been healthy, I actually think mm -hmm. Gavin Stone would have been the number five starter because um, that's how good of a spring he had. Uh, everyone keeps talking about like, oh, Emma, Emma got hurt, and that's why Stone got the fifth start. I, I, I don't even think that even played a factor into it. Um, you know, we also have to remember he was the the top prize uh, starting pitcher, not yeah. the prospect last season it just didn't work out but i think if he figures out a couple of things here and there he also has a chance to be really good yeah it's odd how you know like pitchers i mean it, it's it's easy to understand but it, it's it's kind of odd how fast he fell like from one like came up there and he just couldn't land pit, hitter big league hitters weren't respecting like his changeup. like it's odd how fast that kind of happened uh so i'm i'm definitely with you on that like i, I was one of the people that's saying yeah if emma sheehan was healthy and all things were equal you know, his stuff we like at Dodger Blue. We talk about a ton how we love Emmett Sheehan's stuff, and he might have some of the best of their young guys. But the, you know, maturation from Gavin Stone and what he's kind of had, he kind of pitched himself straight into that. Uh, and then, you know, 
we got we have to because Blake's here. We have to talk about the big maple and Blake immediate. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know it's the best because we he's been telling me for years, Blon, I swear. He's been for years been talking about how we need to get the big maple out west. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's been the best. So Blake, Blake, Blake Williams took a big W and James Paxson taking a one year deal. Blake, what did you see from James Paxson, man? Like, do you I know the wa- five walks will jump out at you, and that's that's not a thing that you can sustain uh against, you know. Uh, Maybe a lineup that's going to attack you some more, like the Braves or something. But what did you see from Prax on Monday? Yeah, he definitely needs to keep runners off base a little better than he did. I think he also gave up four hits or something. So nine base runners in five innings. It wasn't great. Brett his pitch count up a bit. But, I mean, he, he went five scoreless, even three. He was able to pitch through the jams. And that's going to come back to hurt him if he keeps allowing base runners. So he really needs to figure that out. But, I mean, for a number five starter, I don't think you can ask for much more, like, this guy, he would probably be a number three or maybe a four on good rotations, but for the Dodgers to have him as their number five, give another or their only lefty in their rotation right now and some veteran presence in a pretty young overall group, like it's valuable. And I think a lot of people kind of overlook that signing of him, but I think he's going to be a big piece of the rotation this year as long as he stays healthy, which of course with Paxton, that's always the case there, but he has pretty good stuff and he kind of showed off that he. He's a veteran who knows how to pitch and get out of jams, and I think he's going to be a pretty consistent, solid starter for them going forward. Yeah, Juan, that's, that's kind of been, that was my like my thing with James Paxton. That I, I was on Dodgers territory, and I said that Paxton wasn't my X factor, but he was an important piece because he's a there's it's a veteran arm that the Dodgers kind of lacked last year. Like they just had to dip, so they had to dip into their minor leagues, and that's tough when you have to consistently do that. That's a hard thing to really ask of your, you know, your young guys. And just like we saw with Gavin, some things can get exposed and some things can go south if they don't all click right. Um, I just want to know, like, do you feel like same type of thing? Like if they're able to find a happy medium with James Paxton, uh, is he someone who's important? Is he like, he might not start. Like we don't have to like look at him to be a, 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 a postseason starting pitcher, but is he someone that's going to be kind of a bridge to the, to the front end, to the back end? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think even to Blake's point, I think when Walker Buehler comes back, he might be the number six starter. I mean, Crazy. If, like, if you think about it that way, I mean, just having James Paxton just casually being your number six, um, I think that's pretty good. And I think, and, you know, I, I kind of wrote this yesterday. You know, everyone talked about Yoshinobu, uh, Yamamoto, and Shohei Otani, you know, for good reason. Uh, this offseason, they kind of stole the, uh, the headlines. But I actually think the two biggest upgrades were to Oscar and Paxton. Um, and I'll explain, right? People don't go crazy over Otani. Yeah, hey, no, go. You're 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 looking at Teoscar Hernandez fan number one, Blake Paxton well, fan number if, one. I think if you if you if you base it based on what they had, right? Like I think yeah, JD Martinez had 33 bombs and 100 RBIs and 100 games. Like how much more production is Shohei Otani going to give you than that, right? Like maybe seven more home runs, right? It's just rounded up to seven to 40. Um, but I think when you include Teoscar Hernandez replacing, say, David Peralta. Like he might he might pass him in home runs by the end of April, yeah. So I think like just including that part of it, like the automatic immediate upgrade there. And if you think about what the Dodgers had towards the end of the year in the starting rotation, like is he better than Lance Lynn? Like yes, he's better than Lance Lynn. Like is he better than um, Ryan Pepio? He's probably better than Ryan Pepio at, at least at this point in his career. Um, mm-hmm. So I think if you just kind of look at it that way, you got those two guys on one year deals, kind of under the radar moves. Uh, and there are significant upgrades. Like, I, I think those are the two guys where you're like, okay, like we could just improve the edges here by a you know, drastic amount. Uh, and, and I, you know, like you said, is James Paxton going to start a playoff game? Like if he does, a lot of things went wrong. Like, yes. and that's just kind of like, not, not no disrespect to the big maple, Blake. Uh, but I'm just saying like, he's not here for that. He's here to eat up some innings, provide quality innings for, for in, during the regular season. And then in the playoffs, it's just like, dude, thank you for your services. Like, you know, we have Glass and Kirsch and Bueller and, you know, Yamamoto and all these guys. Like, we don't really need you for the playoffs. But during the regular season, he is going to be a, a key piece because Yamamoto is going to probably need extra days as much as possible. Um, you know, they want to try and keep him in that, you know, MPB rotation thing. Kind mm-hmm. of ease his way into the major leagues. Tyler Glass has never pitched 120 innings in his life. So I think getting him, you know, some extra rest is also important. Um, so when you kind of look at it that way, I can think Paxton is going to be a, a pretty big piece on this team. 
yeah, I think they did a great job of setting themselves up. Like it, it people have like were wondered about the longer the offseason went on with Blake Snell or you know, guys like Jordan Montgomery, where is it the Dodgers oh, a one year deal? But like, do they entertain those opportunities? And I was kind of against it a little because I want to have at least a, a slot because once you sign one of those big guys, like it just pushes everything else back. And I like having some, you know, variability there where you're able to bring somebody in or, you know, have the opportunity for young guys to make starts because you have to find innings for them somewhere. If you just completely log jam your starting rotation, that those opportunities really aren't there unless you push everybody back or you find random stuff. So I think it was important. I think having these, this, these one-year deals, you know, not by low, but it's just guys looking to just fill a role instead of a key role it, it, right. it all matters so well, well i don't want to insult blake but I, if if they could have gotten blake snell <laughs> i would have i would have said oh, James, i got you, i would have yeah. sent the big maple somewhere been, else been I, I mean i wouldn't <laughs> have been mad if they had snell like it's a yeah, great maybe, pitcher. Neither, maybe they, maybe uh maple goes to the bullpen they kind of need a lefty reliever there yeah yeah but yeah I, all things considered though like not having to spend at that level, right, of free agency. I mean, what was it, seven million and then like a bunch of incentives? Like that's a, yes. that's a pretty good. I mean, Lance Lynn got more money than that. He got more guaranteed money. money. Yeah, he right. did. So I think like you, you base it on that, I think it's a pretty good deal for the Dodgers. Yeah. All right. All right, Juan. I appreciate you, man. So we're gonna just go rapid fire. Uh you can do yes, no question. You can hit me with a pass. I don't care because they're they're pretty reasonable stuff. We already talked about earlier. Uh, does does Shohei Otani hit his first like his first home run this weekend? No, he hit it tonight. There he is, Blake. Uh, I'll say sometime this week. I don't this weekend. We got like a week still. But he's it's, been hitting it's the ball be hard. Freezing in Chicago, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Freezing. Uh, I just okay. Before, okay, we have to pause. I have to ask. All right, how do you think Juan? But we'll just pause. Rapid fire. How do the Dodgers respond to a hostile environment this weekend in Chicago? Fans going to boo, like it's going to happen. How do they kind of what? What do you see the Dodgers? How do you see them responding to that type? Because it's the first time we're going to see it. Wrigley fans, they will be. It will happen. So, what do you see? Like, how do you think the Dodgers are going to respond to that? Yeah, I'm kind of excited to see it actually. Yeah, like, I was talking with somebody about this yesterday. Like, this is the first time they are going to go on the road, um, mm -hmm. and it is a pretty tough place to play, right? Like Wrigley Field's not, not the they call it a friendly conference. It's not very friendly if you're not friendly. <laughs> not, the team. not friendly. Uh, no. So I think it will be interesting to see how they react. You know, it, it will be Shohei's first time getting booed like this, right? Like mm -hmm. he's always been loved. You know, we, in the Oscar game, in Seattle, they were like. Come to Seattle. Come to Seattle. Like everywhere he goes, everyone he went last year was like, "Please yep. come to us." Like, we're, look, we're cheering you. And now <laughs> it's like, "What? You're gonna be a Dodger for the next decade?" Like, yep. No, I just hate you. So just seeing him, how he reacts to that, I think will be kind of fascinating, right? Like it reminds me of like when LeBron went back to Cleveland that first time, uh, and you know he got booed, and that was the first time that he was like, "Ah, oh, I, I just be the villain, and that that'd yep. be okay." Um, so. It will be interesting to see if they just have that same mindset of like, all right, just boo us and we'll just go in here and sweep you guys. Yes, uh, so I think it's important. Yeah, no, I I had something I, I was on the top of my mind to ask. I can't believe it slipped, but it's it's important. It's it's something that we just we haven't seen there. And they weren't gonna get that in South Korea. They came back home on a nice you know, softball homestand. You could easily just work your way straight into that. All right. Okay. Some guys like it, some guys don't too. Like that's also like a real thing. Like well, some guys yeah. like being liked and some guys enjoy not being liked. Like I think like Muncie is kind of one of those guys who kind of just enjoys like he doesn't, he's like, whatever, I don't really he care. care. Way. Yeah. Uh, just watching how Shohei reacts to this, though. I mean, he's been, dude, he's been, I mean, I'm not saying he can't handle this, by the way. Like, I, I, we, I, we I, don't I, know. I think he can't, we just don't know. I yeah. think he, it, he's been loved his entire life, even back yeah. in Japan. Like, everyone loves him. Uh, he goes back to Japan. He's a hero. This is the first time where people are going to boo him, and it's going to be a pattern everywhere that the Dodgers go this year. Yeah, especially with, you know, his situation going on with Ipe and everything. It's uh, we just don't know how fans like we fans are speculating all the time, memeing everything. And and yeah. and we just we kind of don't know what's going on. The thing is, there. he's so, DH, right? He doesn't have to go out. Yeah. In the outfield, right? Like, like Fernando Tatis Jr. last year, where he had to like go out to right field and hear yep. about the steroids every every five minutes. So that that one part should help him. And I think, you know, having Mookie Betts there, Freddie Freeman, it's, it's, they've been doing this for a long time. Like Mookie Betts played in Boston. Like dude, dude has been through the war. Like he's, he, he understands how it is. So I, I think it's important. Shohei's around like guys who played at the highest level. They played consistently in the playoffs. Like it's important. So it's a, it's a storyline that we'll, we'll have to see firsthand on, you know, we'll see it on TV. You'll be, you know, checking it out and have to re kind of report back to us. I want to know, like for, from what you see, from what you hear, from these guys like I'll, I'll, I'll double back and check in with you there 
but sure. uh, yeah, the you know the last uh, two we got we got two good rapid fire questions. So is a rotation of Walker Bueller, Tony Gonsolin, Clayton Kershaw, Dustin May, Emmett Sheehan the best injured list rotation of all time? Oh, of all time. Ooh. Starting for, five for the sake of it, yeah, like, yeah, sure. Let's yeah, let's just let's just say yes. I mean, Clayton Kershaw's in it, so in one rotation, that's crazy. Like, I mean, I I asked myself Any a question last Kershaw's night. Like, in, in, it's, it's gonna be pretty good. So yeah, Blake. I, like, yeah, Blake. If I asked you in twenty, if I told you in twenty twenty one, those five guys would all be on the injured list at the same time. What would you tell me? Um, what place are the Dodgers finishing? Is it fourth or fifth? Like, that's. A few years back, that was like their main group there. And now, like, they're kind of on the outside looking in of the talent that they have. It's just, it's pretty incredible. I would I would say it's definitely the best IL rotation of all time because I don't think any other team has ever had, like, 10, 12 deep starters like that. Juan, if given 100 swings, could you get a base hit off of Blake Trine and Slider? No chance. <laughs> well... So I don't uh, quick story. Uh, have time for a quick story? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I actually had to throw a pitch off the mound this spring because a couple of years ago I was holding a baseball and I was just asking guys, casual conversation in spring training. Hey, how hard do you think I could throw? Well, because I think it was Miguel Vargas was like, "What are you holding a baseball for? You've never thrown one in your life." And I said, "Well, <laughs> relax, buddy. I I played in a little, little respect. Bit. Yeah, I put some respect on my name. I played in a yeah. high school." Uh, yeah, I wasn't always this out of shape. So I was just kind of like, so I started asking guys, how hard do you think I could throw? Some guys were like 80. And I was like, dude, if I was throwing 80, like I'd be in the gym right now trying to get you to know what I mean? Like I'd be a drive line. So I'm like, no, no chance. Like my arm will fall off. Some guys were like 47. And I was like, all right, that's disrespectful. So then I asked Friedman, right? Andrew Friedman. That was my biggest mistake. So I asked him. And he was like, I don't know, but now I really need to see it. So this was oh, last man. spring. And it kept, the whole time, like Mark Pryor got, in, got into it. Mark Pryor thought I, was, I threw 74, which concerning. Uh, so I was like, no, there's no way I can throw 74. But I, we set a line at 60, 60 and a half. It was actually 64 and a half, but I bumped it down because I was like, that's unrealistic. Yeah, I threw, a, so I threw a pitch off the mound this year. Well, many pitches off the mound this year, and I got to sixty, so I lost the bet. Oh, but yeah, it was kind of depressing, but it was humbling, and it was a great perspective of how hard this game is. I was like, dude, that mound is so far away, uh, and you, you you kind of see it on a daily basis, and you're just kind of like, how hard could it be to hit this thing? It's so no, like I'm not making that mistake ever again of thinking I can do something even remotely close to what they do. So I'm taking not can I I'll, sh I'll shoot half the team. Yes. I'm there you go. Like, you know, there, but I'm hitting no chance. We need you Blake? on the record real quick. Are you uh, out shooting Matt Moreno on the basketball court? Yeah. hundred percent. Ooh. Yes. There he is. My three meal. There, there and I'm go. taking him off the bounce too. Like there's, he, he, I, I'm not saying I can guard him. I don't play any defense, but I can <laughs> guarantee you he can guard me. I love it. I love we love that. Blake, you getting a hit? You getting one. Are you making contact? I don't even care about a hit. Are you making contact? No, I don't I don't think so. I wasn't a good hitter in high school. Like there's no chance of touching trying to Is there slider. a pitch that you guys think you can hit? Like from anybody? Yeah. Like a don't 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 trap me into that. That's no, you don't know. Like, you don't get through a fastball. <laughs> Ted Lilly's or Jamie Moyer's fastball. Right. Jamie Moyer and his career really, in 78. That's like, still hard. I mean, it can be done. Just, like sit in on ninety and be like, "Oh wow, this I, is hard." Like, it, I don't I know. Do, like, it might. Yeah. Also, a hit. I, not hitting it. Like you got to get a hit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With defense, no chance. But like, I could put the ball in play without defense. On, you're on Jimmy Jimmy without Warner. defense, yeah. <laughs> put me in the cage, you know. <laughs> yeah. Then it's like, but other than that, I don't. I'm not. We'll just say. We'll just say myself. Probably not. I'm not. No, he coming. I'm a lefty. I'm standing in there. That thing is hitting me in the. I'm swinging and it's in the already in the left-handed batter's box. It's hitting my back knee and I'm just on the floor. So that's what would happen with me. Yeah, so I'm no just gonna chance. say no. I have no always wanted to stand in like an R.A. Dickey knuckleball though. Okay. That, I think that would be kind of cool just to see it. Yeah, I would do that. I would and absolutely you do that. Blow your back would... out, like out swinging it. So no. tear my oblique. 
you don't want Dickie's knuckleball. He threw that harder. Like he was like 60s, 70s with his. Yeah, you want one like of the guys Waldron who throws like yeah, Waldron. Yeah. Yeah. Give me Wal. When I go to San Diego, I'll be like, give me, I can take you. Give me Waldron. Give me Waldron. Three, three, yeah, three outs. Meet me there. Right on. All right, Matt. All right, you know, right, yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> Matt Waldron. We'll get you there, bro. You know, we we'll nice get you. Juan's too. coming. Matt, Matt Waldron. Nice yeah. Guy. As you know, that's kind of all we have today. I want to give a special thanks. Juan Trebio, MLB.com. You know, he's a fantastic follow on social media. Appreciate you, man. Hopefully we'll talk soon. I'll report back. You know, well, maybe we'll get you, you know, see if we can check in in a few weeks. Get report back to me on there. I'd love to talk to you again. You know, I'm, you know, hopefully we can do that. You know, hopefully Chicago is good to you. Uh, get some basketball games in and, and we'll report back. We'll talk soon. No, I'm going to be okay. covered up, dude. It's going to be 30 degrees, which in my body, that's like negative 30. Me too. I'm from Florida, so I hate 30, me and 30 don't – we don't have a good relationship. But, no, I, I thank you guys for having me. I know we ran yeah. a little longer than expected, but uh, always fun to talk to you guys. Absolutely. You know, I'm I'm Scott Gearman. This is Blake Williams. You can find his stuff at DodgerBlue.com. You can find Juan's stuff at MLB.com. can find him at Trip, like I said, terrific follow on social media. You know, he's hilarious. Guy's the best um, header, like social media, Twitter header in the game. Like, I love that. That makes me laugh every single time. Uh, Give us a big, make sure you like, hit that like, subscribe, ring the notification bell. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you so much.